Welcome once again my dear students and today we are going to talk about a very very contemporary and uh, relevant topic that is directing which is uh, module 2 unit 5 of your principles of management paper. Now when we talk about directing I think uh, what we are going to expect today in this session we'll try and have a look at the concept of directing we'll try and look into the steps in the directing functions so with special reference to communication leadership and motivation. So let's start with this today's session on directing. Now if you see directing is an interpersonal aspect of management process. It is related to the activities that deal directly with influencing, guiding, supervising and motivating the people in the organization for attainment of objectives. Now when we talk about directing, I think we all should remember something. There are different steps involved in the directing process. And I think the three most important thing is communication, leadership and motivation because in an organization it need to have a sound communication you need to have exercise sound leadership and above all all the employees across the domain needs to be motivated then only the organization will be able to achieve its objective now what exactly is the concept of communication we are living in an era where communication is the key we say that survival for the fittest is a mantra of the game it's no longer a seller's market. It's, we say, the buyer's market. Now, communication means the transference and understanding of meaning. And I'll just try and talk about some kind of a research finding here. Research indicates that poor communication is the most frequently cited source of interpersonal conflict. Now, what does it mean? Every organization, you will see there are people. When there are people, they can be in formal or informal groups. They will be in formal and informal teams. Now when there is a teamwork happening, when there is a group, different heads means different kind of ideas, different kind of opinions. Often what happens, it leads to some kind of a conflict. And poor communication is the most frequently cited source of interpersonal conflict. Now what do we mean by conflict? We'll try and talk about it later on. But let's look at communication first. No group can exist without communication. That is the transference of meaning among its members. Now when we talk about this, it is only through transmitting the meaning from one person to another that information and ideas can be conveyed. If you are trying to convey your ideas to your colleague or to your boss or to your subordinate, it is with the help of communication. It can be verbal, it can be written. So this is the way you try and communicate. When we talk about communication, how are the steps involved in it? What exactly is the communication process like? In communication, we normally see there are two parties involved. The first one we say is the sender. The sender is the person who initiates a message by encoding a thought. Suppose what am I doing here today? I have a lot of thoughts, a lot of ideas in my mind. So I am trying to encode those thoughts. The next important thing is the communication process is the thought. So I am the sender in front of you and there are a lot of thoughts in my mind. Now first information exists in the mind of the sender. This can be a concept, it can be an idea, it can be an information or even feelings. Now what happened next? I am trying to encode those thoughts. The third thing in the communication process is called encoding. What do we mean by encoding? Encoding means I am trying to give some kind of a meaning. I am trying to give some kind of a message. The thoughts are transformed into some kind of a words or symbol. And then what happens? It is passing through some kind of a medium. So this audiovisual medium is a medium with the help of which my thoughts are passing to you. There is a channel. Channel is nothing but it is a medium through which the message travels. Now it is selected by the center who must determine whether to use a formal or an informal channel. In the organization also you will see there are a lot of communication happening. And more often than not these are through some kind of a formal channel. Say for example you talk about an educational institute, a university like yours. If there are certain kind of official communication addressed to the students, I hope and I believe there are certain kind of formal channels through which that notices may be put up on your website or maybe you can get hold of those notices from your 
study centers and all so this is what we say a formal channel of communication now what happened with this channel the communication the ideas the words are reaching the receiver so in this context you are the receiver the person to whom the message is directed and what happened next the receiver on receiving the message they try to do something which is called decoding so decoding is lastly the receiver translate the words or symbols into a concept or information that a person can understand so we start off with some kind of a sender in the communication process the idea comes into the mind of the sender the ideas are then encoded by the sender then it passes through some kind of a channel and on receiving this the receiver what happens they decode and once the decoding is done the most important thing we say is the feedback loop if the feedback is reaching from the receiver to the sender and if there is no kind of problem so we say the communication happens to be complete it is understood by the receiver so that is what we expect in communication we move on to the next thing of communication which is the steps involved in communication and often what happens we hear some kind of a barrier in communication now what is this barrier it can be external barriers maybe noise and all so that might also cause some kind of a problem in the communication often what happens there are certain kind of internal barrier also in the mind of the receiver so those often acts as barrier in communication as i already mentioned the feedback is the final link in the communication loop which is very very important for effective communication it check how successful we have been in transferring our message as originally intended so that is a very important aspect of communication and i think communication happens to be one of the important area under directing and all leadership happens to be the next important thing and we all often hear the term that leaders are born and not made there are differences of opinion about this some people say no leaders can be made some people say no you are born with some kind of a leadership quality or trait and this is evident from across the section of the society you talk from maybe business point of view you talk from some kind of a sports world you will have a lot of examples in front of us so today we will next talk about leadership in brief so when we talk about leadership what is this the ability to influence a group towards achievement of goal that is leadership the source of this influence may be formal that is provided by the position of managerial rank in an organization or the influence may be outside the formal structure of the organization according to john cotter of the harvard business school he says that management is about coping with complexity whereas my dear students leadership in contrast is about coping with change so you can see a clear distinction between the concept of management and leadership as given by john cotter he says management i quote again is about coping with complexity whereas leadership in contrast is about coping with change so in this dimension if we look we'll see that there are different kind of theories over the years that have talked about leadership the traditional or the early theories we go by the name called trait theories what are trait trait consider personal qualities and characteristics that differentiate a leader from a non leader so according to the trait theory of leadership they say that there are certain qualities there are certain characteristics which differentiate a leader from a non leader in your organization if you join some organization some day if you are probably the md or the ceo of the company you will see there are people in your organization with different kind of qualities and characteristics based on that you can make out who exactly are going to be leader and who are there to be just in the team it emerged around 1930s the trait theory and they highlighted six trait which probably if you have then chances are that you are going to become a good leader what are those six trait i repeat once again ambition and energy first of all it is expected of a leader to have ambition without ambition probably you cannot reach anywhere not only having ambition but you need to be energetic that is the first trait we expect from a leader as per trait theory the second one the desire to lead is it a burden if somebody ask you to lead a team or probably you are looking for that opportunity so the desire should be there from within so the desire to lead happens to be the next important trait of a leader third one is a leader should always be honest and should have high integrity the fourth important thing enough self confidence if a leader does not have self confidence what sort of a confidence will be there in the team so the leader should have enough self confidence the fifth one is the leader should have enough intelligence he should know or she should know how to tackle different situation from a intelligent level point of view and the last but not the least is job relevant knowledge 
he or she should be having enough idea about what the expectation of the job if they are leading whether it's sports whether it's a business or something else so these are traits which research has shown that some traits increase the likelihood of success as a leader but none of these traits guarantee success so my dear students these are early theories of leadership as i already said emerged around the 1930s we move on from the trait theory we come to the next era which is called the behavioral theory and when we talk about behavioral theory of leadership it proposes that specific behavior differentiate leader from non leader the most comprehensive study of behavioral theory emerged from the research that began at ohio state university in the late 1940s so from the 1930s we have come little bit ahead we are coming to the era of 1940s and the most important thing is the ohio study when we come under this there are two dimension to it one is called initiating structure what do we understand by initiating structure my dear students the extent to which a leader is likely to define and structure his or her role and those of subordinate in search for goal that is initiating structure the second dimension is consideration what do we mean by consideration the extent to which a leader is expected to have job relationship characterized by mutual trust respect for subordinates ideas and regard for their feeling so we can see there are two different dimension one is focusing on the job the other one is you are treating your team member as a whole individual you are concerned about their ideas you are concerned about their feelings their emotions and there are question of mutual trust so that is very important in the context of behavioral theory of leadership we come to the next one which is called situational theory now according to this theory a uh, leader's behavior will change depending on the situation this model is called the situational leadership theory and in short we say slt has been incorporated at over 400 of the fortune 500 companies so you can understand what exactly is the dimension of this theory it is a contingency theory that focuses on the follower so we have come a long way from the trait theory we have come to the behavioral theory and from the behavioral theory we are coming into the situational theory which talks about a leader probably behaves differently depending on the situation so it is a contingency theory that focuses on the followers leadership theory the emphasis on the follower in leadership effectiveness reflects the reality that it is the follower who accept or reject a leader i repeat once again remember this it is the follower who either accept or who reject the leader so we cannot have leadership without followership so it goes hand in hand so that is one of the most important thing we should remember and there are enough examples of good business leader you talk about the late probably steve jobs you talk about maybe bill gates you talk about our own mr ratan tata you talk from the world of sports there are enough good leaders who probably have made a difference both in their field as a sports person as well as in the business context why forget dhirubhai ambani so he also made a lot of difference so when it comes to the next area of directing in the organization is motivation now what is motivation and motivation is nothing but it is the willingness it is the willingness to exert high level of efforts towards organizational goals conditioned by the effort and ability to satisfy some individual needs now when it comes to motivation i think it is very very important for us it is the spirit of people which is ignited by something such as a message appeal or maybe the visual or something so motivation i think there are a lot of talks that yes your employees need to be motivated and lot of companies are coming up with innovative ideas and means of motivating their employees there are a lot of theories which are going to help us in understanding the motivation level of the employees as well as our own motivational level and if we go back and look into the concepts you will see a famous theory is called the maslow's theory of motivation which is called the there are some kind of a hierarchy of needs and maslow was the first person who came up with this he started off by saying the first level of needs are called the physiological needs these are basically our basic needs we talk about food we talk about shelter we talk about some kind of a maybe water we talk about rest and all those things once these needs are satisfied then a individual will go up in the order and try and satisfy the next higher order need which is called the safety needs now what does safety need stands for it stands for some kind of a safety and security that is the second level according to maslow's need hierarchy once the safety needs are satisfied you as an individual should go higher order and you will look for something which is called belongingness or maybe some kind of a need for some kind of a social acceptance and all 
building up of relationship and all. Next higher order, the fourth one is called the self-esteem needs. Once your first three order needs are satisfied, you go to the fourth one which is called the self-esteem need. And last but not the least in the higher order need is called the self-actualization. You try and fulfill your potential and this talks about some kind of a creative aspect. How you try and look at it from a creative angle. So these are the five higher five needs which are in a sequence of hierarchy starting from the basic needs till the self-actualization. So in an organization context, it is very important to understand which employee is at which level of need. Some people might already have a lot of affiliation. They have job security. They are well placed in terms of food, shelter, clothing. So you have to understand it is that self-esteem they are looking to achieve or maybe higher order that is a self-actualization. So these are things which as a future manager you need to take note of. Now Maslow's needs you say, he said that lower order needs are satisfied externally. Whereas higher order needs are satisfied internally. When we talk about higher order needs satisfied internally, we mean the self-actualization part of it. According to the situation, place and time, Maslow's theory of motivation is adaptable. And I think this is something which we need to remind ourselves in the organizational setting. When we go about directing people as a manager, we need to take note of this. Our employees, our team members, our subordinate, what level probably they are actually right now. Accordingly, we have to work out the motivational level. Another important theory or a contribution in the field of motivation is from Herzberg. And he came up with this two factor theory, which is called the hygiene and maybe the motivating factor. The hygiene factor, according to Herzberg, he talked about salary and pay. He talked about job security and safety. He talked about some kind of a social needs. So these are hygiene factors. Whereas according to Herzberg, he said that recognition might be a motivating factor giving more responsibility will be a motivating factor. The job itself and some kind of a growth and career advancement can be a motivating factor. So what exactly is the focus of today's discussion, my dear students? We try to get into an organization. We try and found out what exactly should be the role of directing. And in future, if you take up this responsibility, I think three important things, communication, leadership and motivation will be very, very important for you to take note of when you try and direct people. With this, I'll sign off and say thanks once again until next time when we meet. Thank you.